Okay. Hey. Hey. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. 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 It's good to see you. Yeah. Been a while. It's been a really long time. I was talking to my parents about it last night, actually. And my dad said, you know, that uh, your freshman year of college was 18 years ago. It's like, oh my <laughs> God, dad, thanks a lot for that. Yeah, 2003? 2002. Well, I went in New Mexico in 2002. Okay, so maybe 2003, maybe it was my sophomore year. I thought, I thought for some reason you were my, it was the very first class I had in college, but it could have been my sophomore year. Yeah. Or maybe years. maybe it was second semester. It did. It doesn't matter. But it should. It would have been second semester because I didn't teach my first semester. Oh, okay. And um, yeah, and we've seen each other since then. But boy, it's it's been a while. It has been a really long time. Yeah. Um, I remember the first day of class. I think you didn't you didn't show up, and we all kind of were like, "What do we do?" And the secretary finally said, "Just go. I'll I'll contact him." And you emailed us and said. Yeah, I spaced it. I don't, I'm sorry. And then you, you brought us donuts the next class. And then from there, it was just like smooth sailing. Um, but yeah, so, so I guess my first, my first part of this is if you have any questions about what I'm doing to just interject at any time, I have some questions for you. We don't have to be that formal if, if you don't want to, but um, we can kind um, of just... Yeah, a little bit of structure sounds good. And maybe just Tell me what you're doing and then okay. uh, yeah so i guess now we're on week four we just finished week four of not having a school so aps and the state well the state came up with a plan to give aps um i don't want to say but we we ended up coming up with our own continuous learning plan um as a school site and as a district and so for visual arts, I was given a very small set of requirements and um, I, I, I want to be able to still provide my students with content and resources and if they respond, great. And if they don't, that's of course fine too. But I figured I would take this time to highlight as many New Mexico artists as I can to share what the opportunities would be for students that were interested in making art and just to have a conversation, just to have them see me having a conversation with people I know and people I don't know. So what I'm gonna do is um, create a Google Classroom and they can come in and see your work and respond to it and create their own. And, and that's that's pretty much what, what I have so far. So my okay. other artists that I have, I don't know if you know any of these, I know you know Bo Carey. Sure. I'm planning on talking to him. And then um, someone by the name of, I think it's Jacques Fragua. Okay, I think it's Jake. Oh, Jake. Okay, good to know. And cool. Castel Francisco Diaz. Oh, I, I don't think I know that. Oh, Pastel would be like his uh, tag. Uh, yeah. Thing. Yeah, he does. He did one of the murals downtown. Beautiful floral mural. And for selfish reasons, that one's my favorite. So I want to talk to him about that. Oh, one. right. I do know him, and he's. Belgian or South uh, Ar American? Uh, Argentina, I think. Argentinian, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. And then James Black, he's a screen printer. He has a shop downtown. James is awesome. Yeah. And um, a, a guy by the name of Kirk Giddings. He's one of my dad's friends from college. He's a photographer, actually. Oh, nice. So. Um, seems like you need some ladies on there yeah i have no female representation which i'm surprised at so yeah if, if you have any suggestions email them to me of local artists that would be willing to to talk okay about. um so the first question i had was how we know each other but we kind of went over that larry bob you were my drawing yeah. one are we college. being recorded now is this yeah. part of our interview yeah okay. yeah <laughs> we did go over it yeah it started yeah. recording when the video was shot but i can definitely edit it and Change. I don't care. I just thought I'd ask. Yeah. So uh, you were my drawing one teacher and I had never taken a drawing class, a formal drawing class really ever. And my first art class I took was in high school. And so the idea of being in an art class was fairly new to me. And especially a three hour class twice a week. That was that was a lot. 
and I think you did it in the greatest way. I mean, I have many memories from that class. Mm -hmm. And then I guess you were involved in the donkey gallery from what I remember for a long yep. time. And yeah. I would go and see shows that you had there. And then of course, just on the circuit, I'd see you around town. But um, I guess that's how we know each other and how we met. Yeah, um, I started donkey gallery with uh, two fellow grad students who were in the UNM art program with me. Um, it was their idea. I was kind of new to the scene and they approached me. Uh, a photographer named Sherlock Terry and a painter, and then another painter named David Lee, who's now teaching Sherlock's in Vermont um, and developing exhibits for a children's museum. And David teaches at Albuquerque High. Teaches. Oh, okay. I was going to say David Lee sounds, that name sounds so familiar. Maybe yeah. that's why. And so you might talk to him too. He worked on a mural with uh, Albuquerque High students recently and also has done murals around town and at Site Santa Fe and places okay. like that. So David's really amazing. Um, so yeah, as a grad student, I, and after Donkey Gallery ran for about seven years, uh, we curated like 10 shows a year. And that was really good for me as an artist to get on the other side of the, the gallery door. Um, and I, uh, it was interesting sort of working with artists to sort of help them exhibit their work instead of just trying to exhibit. Yeah, it was in a really good part of town too, I feel like. And for someone who, you, you're not native to. No, I'm from Amarillo originally. Okay. So, uh, sort of from the Southwest, but no, I, uh, I was coming from Brooklyn at that time. Oh, okay. Where, so, so you're from Amarillo and then you went to, Bro and then you came to Albuquerque from Brooklyn. I'm from Amarillo. I studied at the Kansas City Art Institute, oh, okay. which is where I took my first sort of life-changing drawing class. Um, after Kansas City, I went back home to Texas, Amarillo, for uh, about a year, and then I moved to Brooklyn, where I stayed for seven years, uh, working as a carpenter uh, and making my art at night and sort of when I had spare time. I like doing construction because uh, it was sort of project based. It wasn't like getting a job at Office Max where you're there for every Tuesday and Tuesday to Friday for the next million years. I could work really hard for say a month or six weeks and then take uh, three or four weeks off and work on my art. Okay. So I would try to draw enough at night to keep the project alive. And then when I had enough money saved up, uh, I, would, I would go into studio. And that's something you can do when you're when you're young, you know, if you're not, you don't have chronic health problems yet, you don't have kids, uh, uh, you don't have to worry about your retirement plan for a certain for those first few years, you can, uh, you can freelance it and be act like a famous artist, even if you're not. Yeah, looking back at that time, it's interesting. It's probably the only what five to seven years that you can really act that way before people are gonna to start to have any sort of expectation from you. So um, I didn't take advantage of it, but I'm glad you did. It's, it's a good thing to, to look back on. Yeah, and some people figure out how to do it until their dying day. That so, too. Yeah. yeah, I think I would need a little bit more uh, uh, structure and routine, but I, I still give a lot of people props for the way they live their life like that. It's It's something to to be looked at and admired. Okay, so the students that I teach are anywhere from 11 years old to 14 years old. So it's a, it's a pretty classic middle school in town. And it's actually the middle school that I went to, which is pretty interesting. And <laughs> you, you talked about um, carpentry and making things and projects. And I think about the elective classes I took when I was at Cleveland. And one of them was shop class. And, and sometimes I think about why we're motivated to do what we do. And when I say we, I would say anyone with a creative mind, right? You're, you're definitely more in the artist art making scene than I am. I would say maybe I'm probably more art educator, but I, and I love thinking about how I can create something and, and have the idea in my brain and then actually have it come to life and the relationship that it has and how it changes and alters. How would you say, how would you say your middle school brain was in terms of 
did you know what you wanted to do? Were you, have you been creative your whole life? Have you, have you had a family that's been supportive of your artistic career? Like kind of how have you really been able to support yourself doing the art that you love for so long? Uh, that's, that's interesting to think about. And I do think my family was artistic. Um, it was always sort of like a background concern. They had uh, careers and businesses, but there was always like, uh, a paint set that was hadn't been used in a while or was about to be used. Uh, maybe there might be an easel set up somewhere in the house that my mom would be painting on. And then my grandfather, her father, when I would go visit him, it was the same thing. It was a room that he painted and uh, the house was filled with both of their artwork. And so there was a general understanding that, um, yeah, drawing pictures, painting, making stuff was something you could and ought to do and there were no real barriers there um i had a hard time sort of and i know i liked looking at art uh anytime i could find a gallery or some kind of museum um it was fun to go and just look because uh there's something great about a work of art where it's a static sort of portal to another person's vision of the, the world or universe and a lot of times it's a trip back in the past. So I love the big museums and big cities. Albuquerque Museum is a pretty good example where you, you can access like the history of the world through other artists' eyes. So um, I did feel a pull to want to be uh, part of that tradition. I think that artists speak to each other across time through their work. Um, but I didn't necessarily, in my mind, feel like I had a good art education. Mm -hmm. um, I think that art education is hard anyway, mm -hmm. and under a lot of pressure from, uh, from our culture generally. So um, I would say to the students, if you've got a good art teacher like Miss Sarah, um, you know, and appreciate that and use her as a resource because uh, she cares that you care. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I always just tell them, I'm just going to expose you to as much as I can. And if you like it, like it. And if you don't like it, leave it. And that's as much as you can do at this age anyway, I feel like, and giving them the time. I tell them I give them time, space, and materials. And from there, they can take it wherever they'd like. But, um, you know, intrinsic motivation is tough for that age group, um, let alone as adults. But that's kind of my next question for you. And especially since you're standing or sitting in front of some of your work, I feel like you are, your work is, well, I don't want to say all over this town, but you have a significant amount of public pieces that are up on walls. And so, I mean, how has your, I don't, progression been from, I don't know when those murals were made, especially the one I'm thinking about is the one on, humble coffee oh yeah mm -hmm. and is it hard to work on a space that large and you've kind of gone large i want to say recently i guess how, how has your art evolved over the course of the past 15 years 10 or 15 years um well i didn't always paint murals the first but i did i started kind of early probably like when i was 19 or something like that i painted okay. a barney the dinosaur my mom was an elementary uh, principal, and so I painted a Barney the Dinosaur for her. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I really liked painting on the wall. Uh, I really liked being able to make those big gestures. It felt good to me. Um, and then also through construction, you know, I got comfortable with ladders. I was painting mm -hmm. houses, you know, or the interior of an apartment or something. Mm -hmm. So being able to sort of building a wall something like that i was comfortable working on that scale so it, it was a natural sort of progression to to move to the wall i'd also worked with some uh, muralist in as a as a construction sort of support person in new york gallery so i was exposed to how people were starting to work big and um I got my start by painting like a, a bathroom mural in a in a, uh, a nightclub downtown. Was and that Atomic Cantina? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so Burt's was right next door to Atomic Cantina and your work is so familiar. You have a really uh, unique technique. So I remember being in that bathroom being like, this is very familiar to Larry Bob's work and it, it was yours. Yeah. And so I didn't really get paid for that, but I found a way to sort of work, work hard, uh, do my best work um, in a place that was going to give me a lot of exposure because um, yeah, it was just in the scene and people, so even, yeah, it was the, yeah. And uh, that actually helped me. I, I did the bathroom at Atomic Cantina and my next mural was at the Albuquerque Museum because word had got out. So you don't want to work for free forever. Um, but my strategy is to, my strategy has always been to sort of do carpentry uh, then take my art as seriously as I can and get as much money for it as I can, but not to stay busy. I like to always like uh, have the phone ringing. I don't really chase down work. Some artists try to uh, mm -hmm. live off their work, so they uh, price it pretty high, and then they end up they actively sort of promote themselves to try to stay busy at that price point. And then my strategy. Uh, which just relates to my personality is to go to work, do some carpentry, come home. And, uh, the money's about the same. I end up doing about the same amount of work, but it doesn't all come from uh, art. That's, that's when you start doing high dollar commissions, there are a lot of expectations placed on you. Yeah. Having a bathroom somewhere, you can be pretty free. <laughs> That's interesting. I never knew that carpentry side of you, but it's it's fun how you've been able to kind of take both and yeah. use them for that mural practice. So, uh -huh. all right. My next question for you is content. Um, the content that you create, the mural on humble is is a landscape painting, right? There's there's some Southwest themes to it. Was that humble's request, or was that something that you were willing to come up with a sketch on your own and submit to them and they said sure um the second i proposed an image and i had been i had been studying sort of art of the southwest and traditions in the southwest um and that means a lot of different things uh what we think of south as southwest art is a very sort of 20th century sort of european sort of take on the southwest but if you study uh, the history of Mexico or indigenous history here in New Mexico, you know, uh, those traditions are rich and uh, complex and need to be understood on their own terms, not just through like uh, painting, you know, howling coyotes in Santa Fe. It's not just a Southwest art thing. So I had to teach that stuff at CNM for a while and I was, I, I started to see the Southwest and its landscape in a magical light and sort of the, the themes that go on in New Mexican culture is sort of heroic cosmic themes. So um, uh, the bird and the snake and the cactus is something from the Mexican flag, but it's also an Aztec myth about how the, uh, the original people found their homeland. And uh, also, so I wanted to portray that, but in a, in a more sort of heroic, sort of iconographic, but natural sense. Yeah, which you did. I would say it's very successful. It's a really, it's a really nice piece, actually. Um, now, the content on the mural, let's say, in Knob Hill is a little bit more political. Was that based on? Well, there are two in Knob Hill. There's like the Albuquerque mural on artisans oh yeah yeah okay oh yeah i forgot about that one that one's cool yes which is vaguely political because it uh it uses the origi original spelling of albuquerque and inserts uh -huh. the r back in it uh-huh um which if you look at the word uh the word the slang for albuquerque is burke burke with a and you can spell that word with the original spelling of albuquerque if you take the r out and have the contemporary spelling, uh, you can no longer spell that word. So uh, I use sort of like a, a gothic sort of um, tattoo style lettering to sort of like um, embrace like an older uh, 
Chicano idea of Albuquerque. So some sort of like subversively political, like not, not everybody's uh, uh, conscious of that sort of present. But the other mural about fracking. Yeah, that's uh, the one I was thinking away, about. Is, is probably more overt in your face. Yeah. yeah. And and did was that was that uh, commissioned by was that part of the mural program, the Albuquerque mural program? It was it was part of um, ABQ murals. Mm -hmm. And I'd done a I'd done a mural for them the year before on Broadway and lead. And uh, I was working at the time on a comic book about fracking and more specifically about the, uh, the struggle to enact a fracking ordinance in the Sandoval County Commission. And so if you're in middle school, you're probably not super <laughs> familiar with how like local governments work. Right. And it was a crash course for me. But I just had lunch with a guy who was like fighting this fracking thing. And so fracking is a way of drilling for oil where they uh, fracture the rock by injecting poisonous chemicals down there. And some people think that it can contaminate groundwater. And here in New Mexico, or here in Albuquerque, um, fracking just north of town near the, under the river might be a really bad idea. So we started to look, I started watching videos online of the county commission meetings where uh, native activists are talking to sort of uh, Rio Rancho businessmen and they just seem to be talking, speaking in a different language. And uh, to me, it looked like a classic sort of New Mexico struggle. And I wanted to document that because even though it was public record and you could go online and look at it, I felt like nobody was going to see it or uh, the things I was seeing were going to get lost in the drone of uh, hundreds of hours of boring. Well, you're absolutely correct and especially with something so controversial as fracking i'm sure a lot of people don't want a lot of people knowing about it and so yeah. highlighting things like that are are important and i think that's a a, a good role that artists play is communicating communicating ideas and, and things that are controversial to to the public um yeah. tell me and about frankly you know putting a politician's faces on the on yeah. the mural was um uh, not something that you know, a lot of these programs uh, rely on public funding, and that's at the discretion of uh, politicians. And so no politician wants to see any politician up on a city mural. No. Because, and, you know, and then the, the people who set the, um, the, the people who organized Albuquerque murals were not happy, but they also... Uh, I think made a very conscious and noble choice to not censor them. Mm. And so I put them in, in the way of sort of harming their future funding. Um, but I also felt like uh, the city's uh, drinking water was maybe more important than, than any of that. Yeah, maybe just a little bit. Yeah. Um, tell me, have you done I, I, have you done any work at Meow Wolf? I saw something that said that you were part of a program there working with murals as well. Yeah, I did. I worked with Meow, Meow Wolf in several capacities. I uh, I worked at the bowling alley, painting uh, a set of eyeballs and some squiggly sort of snotty forms at the back of the hallway near the bathrooms. Um, and Matt was there in place for the original opening. And then I painted the foyer, uh, like uh, the foyer. When you come in, there's like a multicolored sort of red, uh, black and blue landscape that, uh, that I painted about a year later. And then I was hired for Meow, by Meow Wolf to work as a paint and piglet, pigment specialist in their warehouse. And I held that job for about five and a half months until I was offered the directorship of the Roswell Artist in Residence. Where, um, where I now, now am. I think I said earlier that I was in Albuquerque, but I'm, I live in Roswell and have for uh, about a year and a half. Okay, so that was my next question, is how long you've been in, in Roswell. Explain a little bit about what you do there. I don't know if a lot of people know what residency programs are. So uh, a residency program is uh, usually a nonprofit sort of charitable organization that donates uh, time and money space to an artist. 
So usually uh, people will set aside a house or a uh, set of houses and studios for artists to come and uh, take time and work. The idea being that um, artists sometimes uh, have a hard time finding space, finding time, finding funding to focus on a project. So uh, our program started 53 years ago by a local businessman who didn't want to leave Roswell to have interesting conversations with passionate artists. So we started bringing them to town. Mm -hmm. And uh, we serve six artists at a time and they're here for a year. And we give them a paycheck every month. Uh, they have a great house, a really big studio, and uh, nothing to block up their time. We don't ask them to donate work or to teach classes or do anything. Wow, that sounds like a great opportunity. Yeah, so I make sure they're happy, uh, make sure their lights are on, and uh, also run the selection process and then introduce them when they, if they want to give a talk. Um, so I'm the public uh, face of that program. And uh, it's a great, great job. They're, Great. It's not totally stress-free, but uh, I get to help people do stuff. I work with my hands. I get to work my, uh, do my own stuff. So it's a really wonderful opportunity. How long do you think you'll be down in Roswell? I don't know the answer to that, but I think, you know, you have to, for a position like this where the person moves in and lives there, and uh, we needed to update some of our processes and get, uh, get online with some stuff. I feel like five years is what makes sense to as a sort of minimum, and then ten years uh, would sort of like create a legacy and sort of uh, uh, get it to a place where it's ready to pass on. Um, there's something that's really significant about your work, and you. I don't want to say I don't want to put you in a in a box, but you work mainly with black and white. Do you want to expand a little bit about on, on your choice of, of, I don't, I don't know if color or lack of color. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I really love color and um, I've always had a complicated relationship to it. Um, I've always been sort of impatient and I like to move fast. And color, I think to do it well, takes a lot of thought and there's a lot of cleaning of brushes, mixing of paint, remixing of paint. And um, I was always sort of getting, I was always suffering from my lack of patience. I wanted to work fast, I wanted to work big, I wanted to draw, redraw it, redraw it. And uh, color was, an element that was less successful and I felt like holding me back. And I became a little more free when I started working in black and white. And then even for a certain period of time, like with sort of the optical things, started thinking about different ways to um, imitate color or uh, imitate the effects of color by sort of using vibration or tone as a way of creating that those effects, if you will, or, or yeah. um, somehow compensating for the lack of color with uh, different strategies in black and white, which made it as rich for me as if I were mixing color. Yeah, it's the greatest contrast, I think, is black and white, and I go back and forth with my kids all the time, and it's, it's, uh, it's pretty powerful to have art like that, and especially something that you've chosen to do pretty consistently it's it you can recognize your work almost anywhere it's yeah so what that and actually that what I was going to say I was thinking about my art experience as a middle schooler and it was sort of I remember being painfully aware of like sort of my lack of skills I would see something think it was awesome that sounds like would, all of my students yeah yeah and it just looks stupid I like mm -hmm. I'm no good like how do I get that and really it was all through college. Like I learned to draw like in a, in a sort of like formal sort of like drawing class way, but I still didn't know how to do really good sort of graphic comic kind of drawing. And so that was a slow sort of learn, self-learning process after college. And it, um, 
as an artist who uses primarily black and white, I'm always sort of like uh, looking at sort of like the great, my heroes in the comic or graphic world, trying to sort of get some more skills, like figure out how they do things, what are the strategies. And so it's a great time to start. Don't be discouraged if, uh, if you're not doing very good. If you can, once a month, you, you sort of get it one skill, like you copy an artist and learn how to do a certain thing they did, as long as you're adding to it and keep moving forward and having fun, it's uh, you're doing the right thing. Well, and there's so many different mediums. There's so many different artists. I mean, when you think of art, I think my definition has pretty much stayed pretty consistent, but within that definition, you have so many different variables of choice and options. I mean, the possibilities are endless as far as what they can research. And I always just suggest, like you said, figuring out what you like and kind of going from there. And I wouldn't say that copying what artists are doing, I, I don't suggest that you sit and copy something, but copy that style and learn how it would be to make movements. And that's kind of what I'm gonna have them do with one of your pieces. But I think exposure is pretty important and exposing them to things they like and don't like. And then eventually I think they'll kind of start to carve out a space that they feel comfortable making their own. Um, so I'm glad that you said, you know, self-discovery and, and, and searching for things that you like. And, and I guess in a way, I, I want to support not having everything be thrown at them. You know, if at some point that they, they want to learn more, they're going to have to do a fair amount of that on their own. Yeah. And it's never, I, I don't want, uh, I think it's easier than it used to be because you used to have to go to the comic book store and then you look yeah. through and now you can accidentally find hundreds of artists just by being on your phone. And that probably has some downsides too, but um, boy, it's, it's amazing what's out there. So speaking about your work now, and I'm sure you have time to spend working on your work while you're in charge of the residency program. Uh, what, what are you working on and where do you see your art going or where do you see you as an artist transforming in the next let's say 15 because if, if if we met 18 years ago 18 years from now where do you see yourself and where do you see your art <laughs> I don't know that's a little scary you know one thing that's great about being in middle school is that um, <laughs> you're still like on your way up you know you got yeah. like there's still a lot of open, exciting possibilities. Oh, all of them are still available to them, right? I always say, like, embrace this time in your life. This, you're, you're never going to get this back. And it's pretty transformative when you think about the paths that you've taken to lead you where you are now. That's exactly where they are. So it's like, you better not turn left or you better not turn right because you may miss something completely that's really important. But So I don't know the answer to that. I do I have a... Uh, a two-year-old son right now. And so I feel like his life is open and full of possibilities. Um, I, I'm, uh, it's interesting. Um, I see, I see my, my, uh, I don't know the answer to what's gonna happen in the next 15 years. Right now I'm trying to not be too much of a grown up and just focus on him and worry about money. And uh, um, so I'm experimenting with things in studio. I'm doing some printmaking. I'm drawing some, I can, I can send some pictures of those and we can flash them on the screen. I'm doing different things to just try to figure out my way forward. I don't, uh, I still wanna make these big murals and I have some projects coming up. Um, I don't really know what's going to happen in the next 15 years. And looking back, I didn't really know what was going to happen in the last 15 years. Either. Right. Um, I tried to always have something on the horizon. So I think for a middle schooler, it would be really ambitious to uh, paint the backyard fence, but you should ask your parents uh, to do it. And then that could be a summer project. And so if you're thinking in terms of big projects that happen once or twice a year, um, you might be in over your head, it might be hard, but uh, every time you do something and fail, you're gonna learn three or four 
small things on the way that are going to make the next thing more successful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't have any more questions. If there's anything else you want to add, we can continue talking. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you hit on a lot of points that I try to hit on too. So it's nice to hear it reverberated in my brain because sometimes I'm like, am I crazy when I talk to these kids about, you know, it's okay to fail and start again and fail again and start again. And, and um, so it's, it's nice to hear all of that. So. Yeah, that's what I would say. Like a lot of stuff I read and music I listen to, it's all about um, failing and starting over, uh, bouncing back. And it's, I can, when I'm talking to someone else, I can see so clearly that they just need to uh, pick themselves up and try again and have some faith and appreciate what they've got instead of what, what's not happening. But it's so hard to remind yourself of that. Not oh, absolutely. Yeah, if I practiced what I preach to them, I think I would, I would be, I would be a different person. But I think <laughs> it's probably because I've had someone telling me all those things my whole life. So then, in turn, I'm telling them all those, all the things that I've heard for forever and ever. But so that would be my thing: is is try to believe it. And then I think what's great is when you, uh, when you're working with someone who uh, just has as a good enthusiastic energy, which Miss Sarah seems to, um, I think it gets easier. So I would say enjoy the art class when it's working. Uh, actually, my wife uh, taught at La Cueva for a number of years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I think that was, she was a resource, a well of energy, where the kids just came during uh, homeroom or whatever it was, or would eat lunch in the classroom. Yeah. Because it was just a place to do something fun. And so I would say em embrace that, uh, cultivate that sort of flame, that spark inside you that wants to make things interesting because uh, that's what it's about. Yeah, and I guess uh, I do have another question. When you think about that spark and when you think about what's gotten us to this point, I, I would say that a fair amount of it has to do with intrinsic motivation and, and we want to be productive people, productive, creative people. Where do you find the inspiration to keep drawing and keep going? It seems like you are a very productive, creative person. Um, does your brain ever turn off or does it, are you always just kind of thinking about the next thing and, and getting it done? My brain, well, my brain doesn't turn off. I don't think... I think a lot of us have brains that go all the time. It's all about, but the struggle is sort of like directing it to sure. get it off of right. uh, problems or to get it out of binge watching a show or yeah. something like that and get it back in the studio. Um, I don't know that, I don't know the answer to that. I'm one of the people that likes, I really like to stay busy. I do have, the, I get the sense that if I'm binge watching something or especially watching the news or TV, some things are a real art. And so it's a, it's, it's helpful for me to generate, to, to uh, engage with them. Um, but a lot of it to me just feels like mind control. Like someone else is trying to get me to think their thoughts convince me of what they think and I see I feel an inherent danger in that so I do pull away and even if it's just working on a piece of furniture or something like that or drawing or reading a book about my job or something like that um, it's I feel like there's not enough I'm, I think most of us if we are if we take care of ourselves feel like we have a lot to do to improve ourselves or to do a to do better work and there's not enough hours in the day. So I would try to cultivate that about yourself is you have interests, you have abilities and television and other people's agendas are gonna take that away from you because it makes them money. Yeah, and figuring out who you are inside is difficult and so actually spending time with yourself to figure out what your likes and dislikes are as opposed to someone telling you what what they think they should be is 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 hard but it's also great once you kind of figure that out and find a really good spot in the world where you kind of feel like you fit in or 
Yeah. And I think that uh, the middle school is probably a really exciting time because you um, uh, you can think so fast at that age. I've been around some middle schoolers and they're, everything's like fresh and available. And I've, I'm old enough now that I forget to, I think I know stuff. And so I can get sort of like on a train track with my, my thoughts. And so I think the flexibility and versatility of a middle schooler's mind is a great place to hang out. I, I agree. I, I would say that I, that's not the thought that I had when I was in middle school and probably not the one that you had when you were in middle school, but it's, it's, uh, it, it is, it's probably the, the most awkward three years, right, of your life, but also it's, it's, the, it's the most where you, you're going to learn a lot about yourself. Uh, yeah, I always tell them it's going gonna, it's gonna to end. It'll be over, maybe not for a couple more years, but also to just embrace where you are in that moment and to kind of just cruise with, with what's happening and who you're with and what's going on. So, Yeah. Well, it's been an honor to uh, get to speak to you and your class. Thank you so much. I'm going to send you uh, all the information that I'm going to send to them. And okay. then you can kind of see what, what, what's going to be happening, and of course. And then I'll, I'll kind of highlight these other artists as well. One more thing before we go. Uh, the, the piece that I'm going to show them is your piece called Brainbow. Okay. And did you want to talk a little bit about uh, that one for just a minute or so? Um, is that the one that's on the back of 516 Arts? Um, it's like the very first one you have on your website. And it's, it looks like a rainbow, but it, instead it's a brain. It's the Ink on Paper 2016. Oh. And at first I thought rainbow. I had no idea, but it looks like it's a cloud in the shape of a brain. And then you have like a, a, an arching rainbow. It definitely has a Southwest theme. Yeah. Uh, what would I say about that? You know, I realized at some point, and I don't... I don't have a lot of access to sort of like Pueblo religion or Pueblo mythology, you know, native New Mexican uh, indigenous thought. But uh, after taking some classes at UNM, I was educated that a lot of the symbols on Native American pottery reference water and water systems and rain and are sort of like prayers for rain. And so I started looking, thinking about the, the drought in New Mexico, the summer monsoon, that's one of the most beautiful times in northern and central New Mexico. And uh, I started to see that as a, um, a beautiful sort of nurturing and spiritual experience. And uh, looking at sort of the weather systems as the natural intelligence of the world. And so that's where all that comes from. Uh, it's some of the most beautiful, visually beautiful uh, things in our lives, a rainbow, uh, the rains, or the way the clouds form in summer, uh, the thunderstorms at sunset are some of my very favorite things. And seeing it as a nurturing, healing, and intelligent system uh, was a really powerful thing for me. You're, you're, you're really successful in the work that you create in highlighting all of those um, those different pieces that you talked about, the, the culture, the, the color of our landscape, the, the, what, what, I guess what the Southwest has to offer. And I, I know that you're not originally from here, but you've done a good job. You've done a great job highlighting this area of the country. And, and I, I, would, I would argue that I think you probably, you like it a lot. <laughs> I definitely like it a lot, you know. And again, I'm not, I don't want to copy it or take it, but I do want to, uh, understand it and have it affect me so that so that my life's richer and I... yeah absolutely well thank you for taking your time on a early saturday morning i appreciate it and it was Thanks, it was really nice to see you and talk to you as well yeah keep up the good work thank you best to your students okay talk to you later